Well, he, my Cam, my boss, he was like, get the students asking guy questions. <laughs> And they all seem a little shy. We were supposed to get drunk and ask you questions. Oh, I see. That's a, a fine assignment. Yeah. <laughs> so you have a, an expense account this. to buy. I do have an, an expense, expense account, account to buy this. round after round of question loosening drinks. Biggest fear. Um, this is actually a serious answer uh, because it's um, death of loved ones. It's 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 a fear that's dominating my life so much now that it's ruining my life. Is that ketchup? Yes. Okay. And ketchup. Bon and, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of deal with these. Yes, please. Strange you can combinations stop of. So no, I'm, I'm gonna yeah. Keep thanks. Recording. Before some horrifyingly pornographic, <laughs> deep, deep fake, <laughs> deep fake results. Yeah, you have my email. <laughs> I live with my dog, and during the pandemic, we just spent so much time just in each other's heads. And I started to imagine that my dog didn't like me that much, and um, and that it would rather have another owner. I think I, I think I was cracking up. I honestly do, like so many people during the pandemic, but. God, I love that thing, and and I had a weird brush with its death. The vet gave it a, a a bad diagnosis to have only two weeks to live at Christmas. So I spent ten days waiting for a biopsy to come back, um, sort of grieving it and saying goodbye to my dog. And then it turned out that when the biopsy came back, it was cancer-free, and it, it had more than two weeks to live. And but now I consider it half dead and half alive, and I just live in fear getting sick. Extras look different now than they did in my favorite period. Like what, what you saw way? tonight. Yeah. Well, everyone's really yes. fit. <laughs> All actors go to the gym. They have zero body fat. They have six pack of abs. They have chiseled features. And back in those days, everyone was kind of doughy and bland or they, or they were cast for having really strange mugs, you know? And, yeah, um, characteristics. Like they still have character actors and everything, but even they're fit. You know, everyone, the suits look good on them and stuff. You want me? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to hire a wardrobe that. person that just makes the suits. Like, well, they'll take perfect fittings for everyone, and then we'll make all the actors change, <laughs> change <laughs> suits or something like that so that everyone looks kind of sweaty and uncomfortable. Yeah, I'm one of those people that I've often thought of myself as pretty grounded, that I don't get too high when something really good happens, and I don't get too low when things get really bad. I think I am pretty level-headed about most things, but I have to say that there was a day that just before I went on stage at the Deutsche Oper, a big opera house in Berlin to present uh, a live music, a live orchestra version of my silent film, Brand Upon the Brain. My daughter phoned me to tell me she was pregnant with her first child, and I was just so thrilled for her and happy for myself, and then the show went the show was really nerve-wracking. There were so many moving parts, and I was the stage manager as well as the film director of this, all the live elements for this motion picture presentation. And I had to introduce the movie in English and in French and in German languages I don't speak. Anyway, um, it all went really well, and and I was a grandfather to be. And so I have to say, I don't have that mental illness because that's a real high for me, yeah. and I've pushed through that cummerbund of mediocrity mm -hmm. that, that sort of girdles the middle. The way of life. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm just picky about how high I get and when. Yeah. Yeah. Um, working in France, I, I, I loved it. And I would do it again. And I found that the French acting community, even their biggest stars, you know, like Mathieu Amalric and Charlotte Rampling and stuff, just live in Paris and are willing to... Hmm. They came and worked for me for minimum wage and just because Metro Amarique was just a scooter ride away yeah, and cool. um, and so all of a sudden everyone just seemed way more approachable hmm. and possible and and I don't really have a lot of films with movie stars in them but but there I felt like I yeah. could you know? yeah I've since ready I, I've learned that I'm the world's slowest learner 
but I am kind of inexorable. <laughs> I will learn it eventually. I got my first cell phone a year ago. I was, a, I was becoming a giant pain in the ass not having one. It just, I always meant to get one, and I even had a few in the past, but I would throw them in the lake in anger. I'd get angry at somebody and throw them in the lake. <laughs> something and I go, damn. <laughs> that's that. actually really useful yeah. of a piece of <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then, anyway, now I've got one and I've learned not to throw it out. Um, what inspired Sissy Boy Slap for you? You all better go back to the gym. You look like you're gaining weight. I gotta go to this shop and buy some condoms. And remember, no slapping. I made that movie out of spite. Okay. Um, my producer, Neve Fitchman, who's my dear friend now, but uh, we, we've always had a hilarious uh, frenemy sort of relationship. And uh, he produced my movie, Saddest Music in the World. And, and I, making the movie was exhausting for me. It was the biggest movie I'd made yet. And I was thoroughly spent. And then he said, hey, I've got an idea to promote the movie. Instead of making a trailer, why don't you make three more shorts using the world that you set Saddest Music in the World in and some of the actors and the ethos and make three shorts and we'll use them as promotional shorts. But I, had, I did not feel like making shorts at that point. And, I, and I'm, please forgive me. As a woman, I hope you can forgive me for saying this, but I was saying, Neve, you can't ask me this. I was being quite a diva about this whole thing. I said, that what you're asking is like asking a woman who's just given birth to a baby after 36 hours of labor. And it's just like asking her to just, just make me three more babies just now, yeah, just three yeah. little ones, you know? I, I just didn't really have it in, in me at no, all. I feel like they'll make it like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. No, it's a long pro. It's, it's, a, it's at least nine months. It's a lot of love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a lot of hate. You got to push out these stupid things, and then you have, you're supposed to love them, no matter how ugly they are. And uh, so, I, 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 um, I argued with him that I didn't want to make them, and I didn't think they'd be good promos or anything. And uh, he won the argument, though. He, he, and I said, okay, I'll make you a movie, and I'll make you sissy boy slap party. So it was a spite movie. It was, not a spite. It was just a that. stupid movie. It's just a movie that couldn't be more stupid. But it's so much fun. Yeah. Well, that was the trouble. The first time I went to Hollywood was 1993, so I was 37 years old. And I didn't even have a credit card yet, and so I couldn't, um, I couldn't, rent, a, I couldn't rent a car, so I had to take a taxi wherever I went in, in L.A. And so every day, like, and I was going to job interviews that someone had arranged for me, a really helpful woman who was the vice president of Fox Searchlight made all these job interviews that were just clearly not going to work out for me, like to be Madonna's music video maker, things like that, you know. Why, why so do you I think went that wouldn't have worked out for you? Though? Well, she like, thought they oh. stood a chance, and yeah. I just, she just didn't I realize how okay. uninitiated I was, okay. how virginal, how quivering and, and Winnipeg bound I was. As soon as I got into this city where you know I didn't even have a credit card and didn't have you know any idea of where anything was or how to behave and um, I don't know it was um, I just wasn't ready so I met a lot of people and jobs that almost seemed like they would fit and I went back home quite crestfallen but then I thought about it for a few months like for three or four months mm -hmm. and I started to think that maybe I could tackle some of these jobs so I phoned back to ask them if I could maybe you know reconsider and if these things I, but uh, none of the people were still at their jobs they'd all been fired wow. or, or, or been moved on <laughs> elsewhere yeah, six months yeah 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 year. all gone and uh, that's just the way it is right it's still like that I know what I used to be up to I used to just make movies without thinking. Mm. I used to just make what it felt had to be made. Now I sort of understand. I don't know if that's useful or not, but mm. I understand why I made them. And and now I put that kind of thought into something before I've made it. Mm. And I think it does actually improve the film. But a lot of it is stuff you do unconsciously, like I was talking about in the Q&A about how it didn't occur to us till later, till we were actually making it, that we had wisely chosen to adapt Vertigo because of its, mm -hmm. the themes that rhyme in it 
with what we are actually doing and stuff like that. So. Um, since do you have a hard time watching films as a filmmaker? Like, has no, I get told if you mean like. Am I critical of the filmmaking? Or like, yeah, like mostly I you, get lost in films. You totally. get lost in these. I especially, over you? especially if I'm in a theater with an okay. audience, yeah. which isn't often enough. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just I'm just a little kid watching a movie. Mm -hmm. Then every now and then, you know, I actually I'll think, oh, that was a really bad decision. <laughs> but I don't I don't say I would have made a better movie. You know, I never say that because I know how hard it is making a movie. And I've, I never really feel like saying a movie's really crappy or anything, because mm. it's almost as hard making a crappy movie as a great one. And sometimes you can be not brilliant and make a brilliant movie, but not very often. <laughs> but, you know, every now and then the elements just line up and, mm. and you fluke things out. <laughs>